building a business may feel like a big jump. But On Deck Small Business Loans can help keep you afloat. With lines of credit up to $100,000 and term loans up to $250,000, On Deck lets you choose the loan that's right for your business. As a top-rated online small business lender, OnDeck's team of loan advisors can help you find the right business loan to fit your needs. Visit OnDeck.com for more information. Depending on certain loan attributes, your business loan may be issued by OnDeck or Celtic Bank. OnDeck does not lend in North Dakota. All loans and amounts subject to lender approval. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. With Capella University's game-changing FlexPath learning format, you gain relevant skills you can apply to your career right away. Earn your degree from an accredited university and be confident in the quality of your education. Imagina tu futuro de otra manera en capella.edu. Capella University is accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Learn more at capella.edu slash accreditation. Today, we'll be exploring the sounds of comfort. Listen closely. That's the sound of you getting a complimentary hand massage at the nail salon. And that's the sound of your favorite bedroom fan, still spinning after five years. Now listen to the sound of a cold, creamy Starbucks mocha frappuccino drink. Ah, with deliciously satisfying flavors, Starbucks frappuccino drinks are comfort in a bottle. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system... Dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Hey, podcast listeners. Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. With Amazon Music, you have access to the largest catalog of ad-free top podcasts included with your Prime membership. Stay up to date on everything newsworthy by downloading the Amazon Music app for free or go to amazon.com slash ad-free news. That's amazon.com slash ad-free news to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Doogie. Sam. It's time for a really serious football debate. Has Pep Guardiola really ruined football? Pep's one of the greatest of all time, but he has hurt football. He won very That's true. partly through Blame how him. good he is and the level he gets out of his teams. Pep really has changed the He's whole league. It. He's, He's ruined it. He's turned the, the Premier league, league into a farmer's league. Every, why is every team now trying to play out from the back? Not every defender who's like six foot five should be able to pass wow. like that Andrea Perla. Everyone copies him. Why? Because it's good. Would you rather watch Nathan Ake or Ryan Shawcross? Pep Guardiola, has he perhaps ruined football? Now, I think that's a strong statement because I think Manchester Mr. City and Pep's teams are wonderful to watch. I destroy food and you destroy the brand. Yes, welcome to episode three of The Truth. And today we're tackling another big grizzly bear of a topic centred around Pep Guardiola. I've got the uh, big grizzly bear reference in there because I'm just about to go on holiday to Canada. Oh, like nice. It? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting in the swing of things, getting in, the, in speed. Right, before we dig in, I just want to say that we're very lucky to be even able to do a podcast this week because there was an incident last week that threatened my participation. Oh, wow. I didn't even tell you until now. Last Thursday, I was playing nine aside, and f- for those that don't know, most do, I'm very tall. I went up for a header, and a much shorter person also went up for a header and head-butted me in the throat. It was actually horrendous. That would have been painful. Yeah, it was really painful. I couldn't speak for 36 hours. Really? I was like rasping and just like just about getting words out. I tried to go to the pub after the game and my wife stood in the you door still and wanted me. a drink. <laughs> <laughs> actually, it would have been really foolish because it hurt to swallow as well as speak. So I don't know what I'd been doing there. Just sat in silence, not drinking. But anyway, um, yeah, 36 hours really messed with me. But by Monday morning, I was okay. Glass. Now it's just that if I sneeze, it hurts. Yeah. So if you're a doctor out there, uh, you know, and can tell me why that's happening, I don't know. But I'm good on speaking. Huge. So we have a podcast. Great. Yeah, thank- thankfully. Right, to the football. Interesting juxtaposition this week, Doogie, because we've just come out of the North London derby, which is Arsenal-Tottenham, most entertaining game in the Premier League, arguably nowadays, full of brilliant players. And we're building into 
Man City versus Arsenal, which is a really nice early litmus test for the Premier League title. It's Saka, it's Erling Haaland, it's Rodri, it's Declan Rice. And yet you go on social and all you see is people posting compilations of Premier League players from yesteryear with the hashtag Barclaysman. Mm. So in the week that we're building up to the elite tussle between the Premier League's two best teams, I'm seeing no love for those players and I'm seeing all the love in the world for Michu, <laughs> Wilfred Bonny, Hatton Ben Arthur, Hugo Rodriguez, Wigan Athletic, the long throw king of Rory Delap, and honestly I even saw a compilation for Andy Vyman and he wasn't even any good. <laughs> so what exactly is going on here? Well, it started in the international break, didn't it? Which is always the sort of doldrums of football content on X or Twitter, whatever you want to call it. And I was actually away for the weekend that it started, but like you sort of got back into it after a weekend really switching off and went back onto to Twitter and was seeing compilations of Andre Voronin. <laughs> and I just thought, what what on earth have I fallen into I did into he said, here? what a player then? And he really wasn't He that really good. wasn't. He really wasn't. <laughs> the, the comp reflected it. And it's clear that uh, people just have a real sense of nostalgia for what football, what they perceive football used to be like and the sort of players that used to play. But I think, to be honest, if you make a compilation of the top players now, the players you mentioned, the Sackers, the De Bruyne's, the Foden, you could find some stunning long-range goals in that as well. But yeah. there we have it. Barclays men was the theme of the last couple of weeks. And actually at the weekend, we saw a lot of long-range screamers back in the Premier League. You yeah. know, Harvey Barnes, John Joran yes. in particular, scoring absolutely stunning goals. Uh, so whether it had an impact or not is up for debate. But it is <laughs> it has continued this kind of trend that we've really seen in the last, I would say, 18 months or so, where there's an idea that Pep Guardiola has ruined, in inverted commas, football. Yeah, nostalgia is a hell of a drug. And, um, you know, when John Duran batters in a 40-yarder with a, I think it was a 0.02 XG strike off the backdrop of the Barclaysman trend. I mean, I when I watched that Duran goal, I, was, I believe I witnessed an act of God. <laughs> um, so it provoked comments. And one in particular that I thought was really interesting on social, I posted the goal and said, this is a barely believable strike. And someone wrote, we used to see these every week. Now, I'm not actually sure that that's true. I think nostalgia is kicking in once again. But maybe here, people have a memory of players who made this kind of strike a hallmark of their game and they attempted these strikes a little more often than you see nowadays. Like you still you still get your, like Kevin De Bruyne, as you, as you rightly referenced, What's one of his best qualities? Like battering it in from 25 yards is a Kevin De Bruyne a hallmark. It's mm-hmm. always against Leicester as well. <laughs> and there were, there were many more players back then in the, in the period that we're sort of referencing here, 2000 to 2012, something like that, that used to make this part of their game. Raphael van der Vaart is top of my list. Nico Kranchar is second. Thomas Hitzelsberger even Nanny, I think I associate with hitting and letting fly. Mm-hmm. They didn't do this every week. They, did, they may have tried it. Again, we're yearning for a different time of football. And it's human nature, you know, nostalgia. It's not just football. It's, it's everything. But apparently, a, a section of football Twitter have decided to just blame Pep for a lack of all of these things. Why has he been blamed? What's he done wrong? I think partly it's because people are bored of Pep Guardiola and Man City winning relentlessly. You know, we are in an unprecedented period of dominance in the Premier League. No one had ever won four Premier League titles in a row. They look very strong favourites, I would now argue, for a fifth straight title in the Premier League. He has completely hoovered up every tournament every trophy since he's become a manager you know in his 15 seasons as a manager he's won the league in all but three and the exceptions being 2011-12 when he lost to an amazing Real Madrid side managed by Jose Mourinho 2016-17 his first year at Man City and 2019-20 where Liverpool went 27 games unbeaten to start the season and couldn't ever really be caught so his success rate in winning league titles is 80 percent he wins the league 80 percent of the times he enters the league Sir Alex Ferguson was at 41% across his entire career. And yes, Sir Alex Ferguson did 39 years, Pep's only done 15. But it does go to show that we are in a, a, an unprecedented period of dominance by one man. And you look at what he's done in the Premier League, La Liga, the Bundesliga. He set the 
consecutive wins record in all of those competitions. He's won the treble twice. He's the first manager to ever get to 100 points in the Premier League. It has been an incredible, incredible period of dominance. And a lot of managers, which I'm sure we'll come on to, have followed suit in terms of trying to you know, emulate what he's done and try to copy his tactics. And football in the Premier League does look pretty different to what it did 15 years ago. But Not I don't necessarily different, very, very, very different. Very I don't different. necessarily see it as a, as a bad thing. You know, the managers that we no longer see in the Premier League, or the type of manager we don't really see. You know, your Sam Allardyces, your Tony Pulises, Alan Pardew. Maybe that's a bit harsh on Alan Pardew, but you know that sort of era. Pardiola. Of, of Pardiola. That sort of <laughs> era of of British manager uh, that played fairly robust Route One football. You know, you look at the teams lower down the table now, you've got Russell Martin, you know, I think one of the top passes, I think most passes completed in the entirety of Europe, I think it even is. So there's a completely different style in the Premier League. Is it worse? I would say no, but is it different? Undoubtedly. So there's what, two bones of contention that you can see here. One is what, bored of him winning, mm-hmm. bored of the dominance. And I think we can all get on board with that. We love a title race that changes hands. We love the fact that recently, for example, in Italy, Serie A has changed hands plenty of times between Inter and AC Milan and Napoli. And you know, it might even do so again this, year, this season. We will see. That's great. And even in La Liga, you're still flip, flipping between Real Madrid and Barcelona with Atleti occasionally providing an uppercut to just change things up if you need to. But obviously City winning over and over again, Pep winning over and over again, and not just not just the Premier League, right? Like triples and quadruples, mm. and like domestic du- triples and doubles all the time. It can get frustrating. What I didn't anticipate really was the fact that people would get sick of the football because it's not as if Man City style, which, yeah, okay, it, it pervades English football and it has inspired a lot of what, what we see lower down the league. And higher up in the league. It's not as if it's like terrible to watch, is it? And it's not like it lacks got like they scored 96 goals in the league last year, 95. Um, that's a lot of goals. <laughs> you know, it's not There's like it's not like, it's not like a team just like anemically storming their way to the league and it and it being absolutely horrific to watch. You you're looking at players like Kevin De Bruyne and 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 Erling Haaland that's scoring bucket bucket loads of goals. So that I find very strange, but it is definitely something that people have a bone to pick with because during the Euros, after the initial flurry of excitement in the opening group stage games, you know, Hungary having a striker that that looks like he could work in a butcher's and a, a couple of really nice, like long range strikes, it hit its point of calm and sterility and, and maybe fatigue. And the football died down a bit, didn't it? Like last last round of group games wasn't great. That kind of bled into the next round. And people started to go, well, I saw this anyway. I saw I saw people start to say, Pep's really, really ruined this. And I'm like, okay, so now we've got we've got Pep at fault for the Euros calming down <laughs> in the third round of group games where a lot of the jeopardy had been removed by the tournament format. That's not particularly fair. But then people were looking at it and go, well, he's, he's got his mitts all over these players. Well, he's got his mitts all over German, Spanish and English players. And two of those teams were two of the best footballing teams in the tournament. So I find it really surprising, but I, I can't escape the idea that actually people really are railing against the idea that Pep's style and its impact on the rest of the league and other managers is something that people are railing against. Yeah, it surprises me. I mean, I see it even amongst people that I would consider, you know, very informed and people I enjoy listening to. They say, you know, it's... It's almost it does almost have a hypnotic sort of quality when it's at its best, his style of play. But I've never found it boring personally, and I think people are more associating the the boredom with the result and the fact that they can you know keep the ball for fifteen minutes. But I actually think it's so impressive how they do that. I find his tactical innovations, the way that he's introduced inverted fullbacks, you know, centre back stepping into midfield, you know, no false nines. You know, there are so many innovations that we now take for granted that Pep Guardiola. If he didn't start himself, he definitely popularised by winning with them so effectively. Yeah, for sure. I mean, sometimes he was turning the pages of history. Like if you read Jonathan Wilson's Inverting the Pyramid, a lot of what Pep has done has been done over the, from 1958, Hungary, all the way through to, to, you know, 2010. And that's not to take anything away from him. Well done for modernising those tactics and bringing them through. And then every six months, tweak, change, stay on top. There's nothing wrong with that. The, the, the common denominator is... He keeps winning with it, mm. and that's what people get a little bit sick of. But if you were to distill Pep Guardiola's football, like give it a, a, an objective appraisal, it's I've got five bullet points written down. It's possession football with neat passing triangles. It's proper width, 
stretching and allowing wide combinations, you know, inverted fullbacks, overlapping runs, three men in the box, that sort of stuff. Loads of goals. They always score loads of goals. A goalkeeper who five times again comes steaming out of the box and either heads it or kicks it really far, and it's hilarious. Um, and above all, a technical, calm nature to everything they do, which looks so composed. And as you said, it's really impressive the way they can just keep the ball for five minutes, play out of any corner. Take all of that. Like, that's all great, right? Well, exactly. I think people have short-term memories as well. You know, before, let's say, 2009, 2010 in the Premier League, there was managers like Jose Mourinho at the very top of the Premier League. There was managers like Rafa Benitez at the very top of the Premier League, dominating or at least winning regularly. And in Benitez's case, not quite getting over the line in the Premier League, but through basically counter-attack football mm. and, and not necessarily the most, you know, playing into the channels, playing the percentages. And yes, they had some exceptional players in that, but they definitely didn't have the overall dominance that we've seen with Pep Guardiola's football. We've seen international tournaments that have been pretty tough to watch at points. You know, 2010 World Cup wasn't great as a spectacle, really. I know it had a very difficult ball, but, you know, it wasn't... <laughs> it did. It wasn't a great it, tournament. It did have you a know. bad ball. There were some World Cups. I think the 2014 World Cup was pretty exciting. 2018 was pretty exciting. Lots of the football in Qatar, I didn't think, was absolutely brilliant as well. You know, there was some fantastic individual moments in that. But there are... There's so much of what I see on social media is he's ruined individual expression in players. And I just don't think... That is fair. Look at the players that he's targeted over the last three, four years. You know, in the last four summers, he's bought Savio, Jeremy Doku and Jack Grealish. And yes, Jack Grealish hasn't worked out as a signing as we wanted to see. And, you know, you as a Villa fan saw him being the free-flowing force that he was and was one of the most exciting players in the Premier League when he joined. But some transfers to every major club don't work out. But you can't say that Pep Guardiola, Pep Guardiola hasn't let expression, players that love to express themselves and that have flair thrive in his teams. You know, you look at David Silva, you look at Leroy Sane, even Raheem Sterling, now Savio Doku. You know, these are fun players to watch. Yeah. And Doku I, just keeps going. Like, he loses the ball, he tries again. He, tries he loses again. the ball, he tries again. Now, Grealish doesn't do that. Grealish has been neutered ever so slightly, I would say, which is a real shame to watch, obviously. We know what he was like when he was the maverick, you know, expressive playmaker of uh, Aston Villa. And, and to start with at City as well, he feels like he's kind of had that trampled out of him a little bit. But given that Doku just relentlessly goes and goes and goes, and if he loses the ball 18 times, but the 19th one assists, that's fine. That actually starts to reflect poorly on Grealish, not Guardiola, in my opinion, because Grealish, I think, has maybe got into his own head. So something that people would, would raise in this argument would be that uh, you know, Guardiola has neutered Grealish. I think Grealish's lack of confidence has, has sadly neutered Grealish. But on the subject of, of trying to play devil's avocado, as Jack would call it, <laughs> I didn't actually introduce him at the start of the pod. That's how bad a host I am. <laughs> but he is there. I am here, yeah. I also have a, a point to make. So that's a, yes, a, I was going to say, well, please, time. Come and, please, please come and well, play this role. Well, I think that there is actually something quite interesting in what, what Diggy was saying there, that bit about before 2008, 2009. And I'm, I'm really glad that you name-checked Rafa Benitez <laughs> and Jose Mourinho because one of my favourite sort of quotes, criticisms ever that's come out is from former Real Madrid coach Jorge Valdano who wrote in marker after a Champions League game between Liverpool and Chelsea. Benitez is Liverpool and Mourinho is Chelsea back in 2007. And he basically said that their performance was effectively shit having you from a stick. He said, football is made up of subjective, subjective feeling of suggestion and in that Anfield is unbeatable. Put a shit hanging from a stick in the middle of this passionate, crazy stadium and there are people who would tell you it's a work of art. It's not. It's a shit hanging from a stick. <laughs> Chelsea and Liverpool are the clearest, most exaggerated example of the way that football is going. Very intense, very collective, very tactical, very physical and very direct, he added. But a short pass? No. A feint? No. A change of pace? No. A one-two? A nutmeg? A back heel? Don't be ridiculous. None of that. The extreme control and seriousness with which both teams played the semi-final neutralised any creative licence, any moments of exquisite skill. If Didier Drogba was the best player in the first match, it was purely because he was the one who ran the fastest, jumped the highest and crashed into people the hardest. <laughs> Such extreme intensity wipes away talent, even leaving a player of Joe Cole's class disorientated. If football is going the way that Chelsea and Liverpool are taking it, we had better be ready to wave goodbye to any expression of the cleverness and talent we have enjoyed for a century. That is 2007 Champions League semi-final, writing about that game. And I think that this is what people are talking about when they're talking about Pep Guardiola. That is not the same thing. 
They're talking about Gooty doing back heels on a compilation for five minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what... What was his name? Jorge Valdano. I had to double check that. For a second, I thought you were talking about Jorge Valdivia, the old Chilean playmaker. No, which that would have been way more fun. Fun. <laughs> I would, I would have been on board with that as well. He was the guy. And we can come on to that style of player in a bit. But yeah, I, I, understand, I understand his point of view on that. Um, and I think it, it taps into something here that d- occurred to me while I was thinking about this, you know, this topic. Um, Doogie, you used the phrase free-flowing about three minutes ago when talking about possession football. People love to attach free-flowing to the, to the phrase possession football. They, they kind of go hand in mm. hand. Um, is Pep Guardiola's possession football free-flowing or is it strictly rehearsed? And there's the argument that starts to come in and I, I do kind of get it. We're so used to having structure off the ball. Always defensively there's been structure in football for a hundred years. Structure on the ball wasn't necessarily a thing, is a thing. A lot of people like to call it robotic. A lot of people like to call it rehearsed. Some people say it's you know it's too methodical, it's it's sterile. It's possession football, but it's not free-flowing because it is choreographed and rehearsed. Now, using this style, Pep Guardiola frequently breaches the 90-point mark, so you can't say that it's not effective. But that, plus a bit of caution in, in those bigger games... I think I can start to understand a little bit about where people are coming from there. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. I don't think Man City or the current iteration of Man City are as entertaining as particularly the Centurion side of 2017-18. I think that was my favourite ever Premier League side as a neutral to watch anyway. I thought they were, they kind of had a little bit of everything, you know, Sane and Sterling on the wings, Aguero, peak Aguero down the middle and then De Bruyne and and David Silva in front of Fernandinho. That was such a fun, such a fun Mm. front six as it were. There's a, there's an argument that he has sort of um, limited risk, let's say, by making sure that there's another defender into the, the centre of midfield, that there's a kind of centre back at left back in recent years. If mm-hmm. it's not Gavardio, it'll be a Kanji or it'll yeah. be Nathan Ake. And yes, that's not the the bombing forward of a Roberto Carlos, etc. But footballers have kind of evolved, and and you d- see a lot of sides doing this now. And Pep Guardiola isn't forcing these sides to to copy. He's not making everyone follow his ways. You know, he is one manager just because I think they've been inspired and they've seen how dominant he has been with it. There are loads of imitations of his style of play, but, Mm -hmm. you know, there are. We've talked about Ten Hag in recent weeks. He's doing something completely different. And, you know, there are other managers, you know, Ancelotti, very much off the cuff. There are other managers that are allowing different style of play to work. Jurgen Klopp was successful in the Premier League, not to the same extent as Pep Guardiola, but he was playing a different style of football. So to say Pep Guardiola has ruined football, I think is just so harsh because there are managers doing different things and doing different things successfully. I will say, though, the four centre-backs thing, I don't, I mean, there was a game last season. If Tony Pulis did that, everyone would be mad. Well, Tony Pulis did it 10 years ago with West Brom, probably, the Jonas Olsen era. Stoke, surely. Yeah, probably Stoke as well. But I, I definitely remember it happening with West Brom as well. So he was that was 10 to 15 years ago. You know, Tony Pulis, the original tactical innovator, as we all know him as. Um, he's done four centre-backs. This isn't new. Pep is the first, probably the first person to take four centre-backs as a solid strategy and, and, and add it to a possession-based team. That's probably the, the difference. Um, and there was a game last season where Man City played Arsenal. It was nil-nil. There were effectively eight centre-backs on the pitch. Um it was horrific, mm. like genuinely horrific to watch. And that kind of leads us into, and you've just kind of hinted at it, one of the very big enemies, the true enemies, I think, of the people that that have decided that Pep has ruined football, and that is the Pep copycats. Mm. It's about copying him and doing it badly. And that's not to say that Arsenal are doing it badly. I mean, 89 points last year, very good team. Very good team, um, similar to, uh, to Man City in a lot of different ways. Fine. We're not talking about Arteta here. We're talking about the phases of Sarri ball that feel so flatline and dead that you could barely watch it. We're talking about Russell Martin's very one-dimensional style of play at times. Jack, would you even add Vincenzo Italiano into that mix at times? At times. At times? Uh, uh, yeah. It doesn't I, I, have to be all the time. No, uh, there are there, there are moments where I think that's what he was trying to do. But yeah. I, I think he was slightly more direct in terms of what he was doing going long yeah. than, than perhaps Pep ever is. And there are, ele- there are times where you watch Deserbi and you're like, 
you know, it's 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 all the best bits of Pep in terms of the on the ball stuff, and it's just an absolute disaster off the ball. Now that is more entertaining, but you've got a couple of a couple of managers there that I've name checked who, at various points, their style of football it looks to be emulating Pep Guardiola. I mean, Martin has literally talked about it. Um, so has so have a few others, um, and they're not doing it as well. And sometimes it, it leads to great fun, like Deserby, and sometimes it leads to, to real genuine sterility. And when the copycat fails, but it turns out that it's quite boring, that I think it's very valid to rail against that, to try and emulate Pep, do it badly and do it in a really boring way. That's that's the first enemy, I think, the first legitimate enemy here, I think. Yeah, for sure. But then you you talk about Russell Martin being at the bottom of the league. You know, most people, I think, expect Southampton to go down this year. Will you have more fun watching Southampton than you would of, you know, Sunderland 15 years ago, then Derby County when they went down, then teams we like will. West Brom, Hull, Cardiff? <laughs> we will, but will Southampton fans? <sighs> yeah, I but- don't know. I mean, they've had relegations in the past. Would they, would they prefer to see their team play a little bit more on the ball then you know sit well Southampton have never really sat 11 men behind the ball but you get what I mean and I, I do think there's an argument that whilst it may have led to poor imitations at the bottom the general standard of the Premier League since Pep Guardiola has returned to the Premier League is so much higher and I think one way of indicating this is by English team's performances in the Champions League. So from 2008, which was an all-English final, to 2017, which was that Real Madrid-Juventus, there were nine finals. Three English sides made it out of a possible 18. Man United in 2009 and 2011, when they lost heavily to Pep's Barcelona, and 2012 when Chelsea won it. And frankly, I got in trouble the other day for saying that Chelsea weren't the best side in Europe in 2021. They certainly weren't in 2012 either. But fair play, you got <laughs> no, over the line, you they, won the tournament. They were, though, about two years before that. They've yeah, been, they, uh, they've, they've been brilliant. In, they've them, been so. brilliant. And, you know, they, they deserved a Champions League at some stage. They'd had very poor decisions at various times as well. But in the four finals again between 2013 and 2017, not a single English side made it. Pep arrives in 2016-17. And by 2018, you're really starting to see the improvement across and I think that's also you know players managers coaches realizing that the Premier League was on the up and managers like Jurgen Klopp also already being there and turning Liverpool into a a real machine in Europe really because there's been six finals since 2018 and of the 12 sides to feature in them seven have been English and that's Liverpool uh, on three times City twice Chelsea once and Spurs once and the three wins by English sides in the last six years is as many as in the previous 14, dating back to 2005. So English sides are getting better in the Champions League. And I also think it's improving the national team as well. I think the confidence Mm. that Pep Guardiola has instilled in players like Walker, Stones, Grealish, Sterling, Foden at various points, and the players that have also come through Man City's academy, you know, Cole Palmer, Rico Lewis looks like he's going to have a huge future in the international scene. People are excited about what James McAtee can do. I do think he's improved the psyche of English football to believe that we can compete on a technical level with Spain, with Germany. And look, in the summer, it didn't go England's way, but are England on the right path to eventually win a major tournament? Yes. Is that partly down to Pep Guardiola? I would say partly. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think there's something to be said for England's success at youth level as well, playing into that psyche. So like the 2017 to 2019 lot who, you know, it's Foden and Sancho um, and they're winning, they're literally winning World Cups and Euros. It do, that does help if you develop a, a group of players that are quite used to beating Spain, Germany, France, then they just step up to the senior level and they expect to beat Spain, Germany, France. There's no fear, which helps. I'm glad that you brought some statistics to the table there because my my evidence is much more anecdotal. I just happened to watch a full game from the early 2010s the other day on Sky Sports. It was just it was just on, um, you know, just in the middle of the day. It was a full replay of West Ham against Tottenham okay. at Upton Park. Right. It felt like an absolute, like a different planet for a start. <laughs> like genuinely, Upton Park, like was so. Uh, it was such a strange and interesting and wonderful place. But it, it, you know, watching West Ham play there compared to where they play now, different stuff. This is a game, and to, just to give you a, a selection of names that were obviously Mark Noble was involved, obviously, uh, Jermaine Defoe was on the pitch, and uh, Temu Tainio was on as well. So it was a while ago. It was shit. Like, it, oh my god, the football was horrific. And I sat there and I was thinking, like, there was, you know, there's 20 seconds where the ball's in the air. Header, 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 back and forward, out of play. 
There's people kicking each other up into the air. It was horrific stuff, genuinely. A lot of long ball, a lot of direct stuff. The fans were loving it. But I thought, is this the, is this the football that people are pining for? Because it's crap. It's genuinely crap. But that was, that was what football was like back then. Pep, Pep and others have had a huge influence on it since then. And it has changed massively, tactically, as a, as a spectacle. The style has changed. But it's not just that as well. I want to talk about analytics next. Analytics has changed this sport. Before you move on, I, I think there was something just to dial on onto. You know, we're talking about copycats, yeah. and I have a, I've all I've brought today apparently is quotes. But I, I've, I've got a quote <laughs> here from from Lionel Messi, who said Guardiola did football a lot of harm. And I was like, oh, interesting. Why? He said, it seems so easy and so simple that everyone wanted to copy it afterwards. Later, I met a lot of other Guardiolas in inverted commas out there and you realised what it was that we had done Ooh. and I think that there's something in this and I often talk to Chelsea fans in particular about this when we're talking about we were talking about Sarri at the time but also now I think about Maresca as well and they're quite often open about the idea that Guardiola has had this style of football that is distinctly his, the kind of perfection of the Cruyffian vision, if you will. And there's something to be said for copycats in yep. that as, as well, in that Guardiola took something else and perfected it. And I think that Arteta is doing something different, not in perfecting it, but taking Guardiola's mantras and moving them onwards in his own kind of way. And he's doing a good and job. And he's doing a good job of it. But there are lots of managers who want to play this way. And look, Harry Brooks, who is a, a regular feature and guest on, on this podcast, talks about it often that not everyone can play like this. And if you live in League One or League Two and you're teaching your players that there's only one way to play football, that's damaging and dangerous. And Messi talked about this as well. He was like, you know, they're teaching six and seven-year-olds to play Guardiola-esque football. That's a terrible idea. You need to let them have that spontaneity first and then you can instill tactical discipline into them later on. That shouldn't be taken away from kids playing football. And I think there probably is something to dive into a little bit more on those managers who kind of are, are, are kind of mimic peps or, you know, lesser versions of themselves because they feel like that's the only way you can play football. I think that in itself is damaging to football because there are other ways to play the game. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, oof, shots fired at Kike Setien. <laughs> <laughs> you leave Kike Setien out of this. That man was not a pep, that was not a pep regen. That man just played chaos ball all the time. <laughs> He, um, I mean, look, I think Messi's put it really well there, uh, really, really well in terms of being unable to replicate, trying and failing to replicate. And Building a business may feel like a big jump, but on deck small business loans can help keep you afloat. With lines of credit up to $100,000 and term loans up to $250,000, OnDeck lets you choose the loan that's right for your business. As a top-rated online small business lender, OnDeck's team of loan advisors can help you find the right business loan to fit your needs. Visit OnDeck.com for more information. Depending on certain loan attributes, your business loan may be issued by OnDeck or Celtic Bank. OnDeck does not lend in North Dakota. All loans and amounts subject to lender approval. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. With Capella University's game-changing FlexPath learning format, you gain relevant skills you can apply to your career right away. Earn your degree from an accredited university and be confident in the quality of your education. Imagina tu futuro de otra manera en capella.edu. Capella University is accredited by the Higher Learning Commission. Learn more at capella.edu slash accreditation. At your job... Do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. It's time to have your high five moment with High Five Casino, the top social casino where the action and real prizes never stop. Fun spins and big wins are right at your fingertips with over a thousand games, including High Five Casino exclusives. High Five Casino is always free to play with free coins given out every four hours. Sign up today for a free welcome offer that can get you spinning and winning right away. Visit HighFiveCasino.com. High Five Casino. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply. And, and and what it produces, unfortunately, is, is not always that entertaining to watch. Um, thank you for that, Jack. We'll move on to analytics now because the revelation that 
you know, long shots go in 10% of the time or less has changed this game. Um, and I think just to say, oh, well, that's, you know, it goes in 10% of the time is a bit disingenuous. I think people have, have, have and by, by people, I mean like football clubs, analysts have lost sight of the fact that if you hammer a long shot from 25 yards, you could get a rebound, you get a spill, you get a corner. How many teams nowadays are putting so much effort into nailing corner routines? Arsenal, Villa, Brentford, to name to name a handful of teams who clearly spend a lot of time on corners and are very good at them. Tottenham. Tottenham, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, Got him. not that one. Um, there is another one that I'd forgotten about it. Um, look, you can get a corner off off a long shot, whatever. Like it's not, it's not. The ball doesn't disappear if it doesn't go in. Okay, but the fact that it a, a long shot is ten or eight percent, I think it's changed things. I think people look, have looked at crossing percentages and gone, oh god, mm. crossing percentages are low. Mm. You know, a completed cross seven, eight, nine percent of the time sounds pretty poor. So we've converted to cutbacks, low crosses. How many balls are slammed across the six yard line at this point? Absolutely loads of them. A little fun exercise where I went back to what I considered the crossing era. Mm. So I thought, right, when did we cross loads? When Two Sebastian th- Lars and so Morton Gamps Pedersen were around. Basically, I, I landed on the 07 08 Premier League season. Nice. And I looked at the managers in question 14 British and Irish out of 20. O'Neill, McLeish, Hughes, Megson, Jewell, Moyes, Hodgson, Sir Alex, Southgate, Keegan, Redknapp, Koppel, Roy Keane, Kerbishley and Bruce. All managing in the Premier League in 2007-2008. 14 out of 20. Fast forward to this year. I, I'd guess how many British and Irish? Oh, um, off the top of my head, three, four? It's six. Sneaky. It's O'Neill, Howe, McKenna, Russell Martin, Dyche and Cooper. So three are actually oh, yeah. new to the league. So maybe maybe last year you'd been right. Yeah. I don't know. I can't remember. But we'll see. But a lot like a handful of those six managers are on record as being inspired by Pep. Um 14 down to six in 15 odd years. So it's a big drop. And of course, what's come in their place? Dutch, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, German. Maybe Basque. It, and mainly Basque, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like five Basque managers in the yeah. league at any one time at this point. A much more diversified game a much different style of football. And you've got to say, a lot of the success is coming from their style, mm. not the old stuff, right? Well, absolutely. Yeah, I think you listed a lot of the names that were around in 2008. A lot of those names won't be remembered as elite managers. I, I think, think they're called dinosaurs now, mate. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and also, just to pick up on a point, I actually saw this from Duncan Alexander on Twitter, who is Stats King on Twitter. And he shared this prior to this weekend. So there's a lot of chat, obviously, about Barclays men, as we've already discussed, long-range screamers, etc. Goals from outside the box in 2005-06 was 13.6%. Goals from outside the box last year was 13.4%. So a 0.2% drop. Not considerable. So far this season, and this was before the most recent round of fixtures, 157 we then saw, as we said, some long-range screamers Durant, at the weekend. Bombs, yep. Who won PFA Player of the Year last year? Phil Foden. Who scored the most goals from outside the box last year? Phil Foden. Plays for Pep Guardiola. I just don't nice. think it's fair to just be like, Pep only instills one style of play and it's and it's boring. I just don't think it's the fair at all. And what people don't sort of na- maybe, maybe give him enough credit for is the amount of risks that he takes on a regular basis, particularly in the transfer market, you know, selling Julian Alvarez this summer, you know, look at look at the quality of players he sold in the last few windows. Jair Cancelo, Cole Palmer, Mares, Laporte, Sterling, Zinchenko, Jesus, like some of these players haven't gone on to do that much or they've joined clubs at the end of their career in Saudi Arabia or whatever. But that is a lot of quality. Look at the players that he's moved on throughout his career as well. Yaya Torre, Sergio Aguero, Joe Hart, you know, stalwarts of Man City when he arrived. At Barcelona, (laughs) Deco as well. You know, at Bayern Munich, he sold Mario Gomez in his first summer. This guy takes risks and he doesn't just take risks in the style of play that he introduces, but in the market... People always say, oh, this is less about him ruining football, but it's just often a criticism of Pep Guardiola. Oh, he's never been tested. He'd only ever managed an elite club. I'm sorry, when you win the treble in your first season, he's not going to end up managing Stoke. Yeah, no. And there's there's no obligation for him to try his luck at a lower level because as, as Harry Brooks would attest to, there is absolutely no point in playing this kind of football down there. If you don't have the players for it, it's foolish to try. So there's, there's no test to be passed for Pep doing it at Rotherham. Right, he doesn't need to go to Rotherham to to complete that legacy. Um, I just want to pick up on that point because we're coming off the back of a weekend where Man City scored a goal where Edison hoofed it to Haaland and he scored. It was a one-pass goal. 
So again, the copycats that we refer- reference when we talk about you know trying to emulate his style and doing it poorly probably probably don't allow that. They probably ward against that. Far too sterile, far too short. Pep lets his goalkeeper hoof it to his striker if that's the right call, and they got a goal off it literally this past weekend, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's other managers as well that might not follow exactly the Pep Guardiola style of play, but definitely have followed his ideals as well. Like it's it's Thomas Frank, who I think is one of the fiercest sort of advocates for not shooting from distance. And actually last year in the Premier League, they took their shots from the closest distance towards the opposition goal. But yet they complete the most crosses in the Premier League as well. Like people take elements without taking all of it and can still be effective. Right. I've got another point to raise and it's it's sports science, which I think is another massive part of this, this discussion. Uh, when people pine for football of yesteryear, when they, are, when they pine for Nico Cranshaw and they lament that that player disappearing from they the game. They just want to see Harry Redknapp with his arm at the shot. They do. The they do. They also, I think, I think they miss the player that was Juan Roman Riquelme. <laughs> they miss the player that was Pablo Aymar. Are you just talking about me? <laughs> I'm talking about you a bit, but I'm talking about other people too. Basically, we all miss that half drunk, overweight Argentine, like magic wand of a left foot, elite creative player. There is a reason that that player no longer exists in this game and it is that sports science has improved us to the point where they're all just absolute athletic machines. And the game, particularly in the Premier League, is fast and physical and direct. Yes, we always say that, but look at how much running these guys go through. Look at the look how fine tuned they are as athletes. You look at you say Ar- Arna Slot's comments recently against, you know, after the Man United win talking about out like the first key is to outrun the opponent in midfield. It's a midfield of Dominic Zobersley, Ryan Hravenberg and Alexis McAllister. They're fantastic footballers. They're also elite athletes. Sports science has basically squeezed Raquel May out of the game because sports science allowed pressing. Pressing constricted the space between the lines. The number 10 disappeared. It was the last like genuine 10, like Ozil, Hamez. Yeah. Like that. It's that, it's that kind of player who, they, you know, Hamez is still around. So Isco, Isco is still Isco's around, but he's, you know he sometimes he has to go wide to find space, you know that sort of thing. Mm. Or, or you know that that's that that's that's part of the remit for him. And I mean, I remember a time literally ten years ago when people started putting holding midfielders in the ten position in order to try and win the ball back quicker and higher up. You know, I remember Freddie Guarin move, being moved from six to ten for Inter <laughs> to win the ball back higher. I remember Fellaini being put as a ten. Okay, yeah, a bit of a target man, but also put the holding midfielder in the 10 yeah. spot. Maybe you might be able to win the ball back a bit quicker up top. Like I, I, I put, I set myself the task of finding one player that I thought who has survived this. Thomas Muller. He works so hard mm. and that's why he has survived and he Fits can play up front and he can play wide. Like this player has been eradicated from the game due to stylistic stuff, which has been aided by sports science. Pep has been at the forefront of pressing. Fine. But if the game goes this way, if it's physical, if it's fast and it's it's energetic, it's not necessarily his fault. It's it's science. Yeah, right? totally yeah. agree. He also wasn't the guy that made it, you know, into a physical contest. Like Pep's first teams were not overly physical. They might be now, and look, that's him adapting to mm-hmm. the modern game. But we've just talked about those Mourinho sides, those Benita sides, where it was all about physicality. That shift into players who could put it in, I would put Jose Mourinho's door as much as anybody else. And that's not a criticism. That was, you know, it was something different that sure. came to the league and worked, right? That's yeah. that's not on Pep. And when Pep arrived at the Premier League, I mean, you referenced earlier that his first season was like really bad, actually. It's quite it was, average, it was, yeah. was he, They finished fourth on the last day. They got a delayed yeah, game. Yeah, I think they got about 70-odd points. They, 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 I think they beat Swansea to get into the top four. If, if my memory serves and Gael Clichy was was at left back and it was Martin it Chavis. was right really bad um, now before he got his claws into that team properly he did one season in the Premier League at that level and he and he, his immediate realisation was I'm going to need some new fullbacks I need pure speed and athleticism at fullback and he went on to go and sign Kyle Walker for 50 million and Benjamin Mendy yeah. for 50 million like that was like the next thing he was like right fullbacks Let's go. I have to change this immediately. He accepted the reality of the top level of the sport within a season and then made moves to to conjoin with that. He didn't teach us how to play fullbacks and everyone copied. He actually 
ascribed to that, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there were so many smug people in arrived being like, it's never going to work here. It's never, his style of play can't work here. This is the English game. He doesn't know the league, etc. But I think he's shown... Our league. Our, our league. league our yeah. league, all that rubbish. I mean, <laughs> he showed so much adaptability over the years. And I think, you know... I've already said it, but the amount of flair that his sides have shown over the years, and sure, you know, it's not necessarily a thriller minute at the moment, his current side, but don't forget, don't sleep on the artistry of someone like David Silva. The moments Bernardo Silva's provided over the years, the long range screamers of of De Bruyne and, and the pure physicality and, and excellence of Erling Haaland and his mastery of finishing. There is so much to enjoy about this City side. And yes, they have dominated the Premier League, but actually... In comparatively, their Champions League record for a side that's been so dominant is comparatively poor. And they always provide entertaining moments in the Champions League nearly by how they exit the competition. Usually at their expense. Yeah. At their expense, exactly. So it's not like if he'd won four Champions Leagues in a row and five out or whatever it is, six of the last seven Premier League titles. Yeah, I think we've got a better argument for, you know, Pep has completely ruined football by making them too dominant. But actually, the you know, the biggest force in European football since he's been you know, at Man City has been Real Madrid. Yeah. And what are they? They're a team of individuals, as, as <laughs> po- according to what everyone says. So has he ever really ruined football? Yeah. I just, I really can't get he's on board the, yeah, with it. Yeah, he's the antithesis of the Real Madrid approach, really, isn't he? That night and day. Um, I have one more point to broach, uh, but Jack, do you have anything to add? Well, I was going to say, my, I was going to kind of roll back around to something that Diggy spoke about earlier, which was this this dominance. And, and I do think that there is a level of this that, do you think some of this is forced by the fact that over the last, let's say, decade, as social media has risen to a thing and football Twitter in particular, there was this sense that a lot of people would use the term, and I hate it more than anything, but farmers league for others leagues. Right. And what they would point to is that, oh, Bayern have won 10 titles in a row in Germany. Oh, Juventus have won eight yeah. titles in a row PS- in Serie A. Oh, PSG, yeah. PSG have won eight of the last nine. And the, the big two dominate to the point of the nth degree in Spain. And they used to point to the Premier League and be like, look how it changes hands. Look how no (laughs) one's ever won it four times in a row. And now that Pep has come in and done this and shown that it can be done, there is a sense that what they were grappling with there, and you spoke about Serie A recently, and obviously the fact that it's changed hands so many times has been great, but that dominance kind of takes away one of their big arguments to suggest the Premier League is a superior league in anything apart from real finance than anywhere else in Europe. And I wonder if that plays into the idea that people are just looking for something to blame on Pep. Yeah, and look, the only way you can... The only rebuttal from the the Premier League Farmers League thing based on City dominance is, well, if all the English clubs were to do very well in the Champions League, it would prove that it's just a strong league. But, you know, Arsenal didn't really do very well last year. They went out to Bayern Munich. Bayern lost the weekend before to a team that ended up going down. Terrible, terrible result the weekend before and Arsenal had just won. I was like, well, there's no way. I think it's only Villa that made the semi-finals in any European competition out of English sides. So it doesn't doesn't help the argument, um, but it's very difficult to to, to judge those things. I've got one more one more point to throw in, and that is uh, just increased and heightened knowledge across the world that we have nowadays. So I think I think people miss the mystery of football. I think people loved the unknown. The Champions League nights, Deportivo La Coruña, you've heard of two of them. It's Diego Tristan, maybe one other, and that's it. Porto in the Champions League. You might know the guy that scored the most goals. You might know the centre back. That might be it. Um, and you know, going back to '98 World Cup, my sticker book being the reference point. Who are these Romanian lads who plays for Saudi Arabia, and who are the other half of the Norway squad? I'll check my sticker book. Then you know it changes going into Euro 2024. Obviously, not everyone pays as much attention as I do, but I can I recognise every single player that starts for the top 20 nations, and I know half of the other four. You know, I can spell half the Georgian players without looking. Like, I know them. We know these players. There's, there's a lack of mystery due to the fact that we know so much more about the game. We can instantly look up their statistics. And I think people miss that. And at the Euros, I think people misconstrued boring football and blamed Pep for it, <laughs> which we've already established so is a bit odd, for I miss the mystery. I miss the unknown. And I think that's fair in terms of missing, that, if that's what you miss. You can't blame it on him. But it kind of brings me, brings me to the overall point where we talked about quite a lot of things here. We talked about you know, missing the mystery. We've talked about sports science moving the game forward. We've talked about how analytics have changed the game. We've talked about copycats doing it poorly and making it sterile. None of this is his fault. Absolutely none of it. 
In fact, he's had a, a tremendously positive impact on the game in England, across the Champions League, and more. Yeah. In terms of the aesthetics. I think people have, have largely just completely missed the point and ended up blaming him for all these things that are legitimate things to worry about and to miss, but there's, they're nothing to do with him. Well, absolutely. And I think the loudest people on Twitter that are arguing that Pep has ruined football are probably under the age of 22. And before Pep arrived, what, they were in their, they were five, six, seven? You know, they, they, you're not harking back to an era <laughs> that you particularly remember. You're just making noise on social media because yeah. you've seen an amazing comp of Ronaldinho. It, <laughs> You know, there are still players with with license to be creative and there are still an amazing array of goals and teams that play in different styles. But did people blame Messi for being so dominant in his era? No, people enjoyed it. People should enjoy Pep Guardiola football. He has changed the game. I don't think there's been a manager like him. And trust me, when he's gone, there'll be the next trend that comes through and it will evolve once again and people will really miss watching his teams play. And yes, there is a big question mark over Man City's period of dominance, which will be answered at the start of next year. But that's a debate for another podcast. But I genuinely think people are underestimating his impact on football, on tactical innovation and on entertainment. I don't think he's made it more boring. I think he's made it a richer and more enjoyable experience for all of us. Just go back and watch the same Tottenham West Ham game that I watched the other day. (laughs) Please. (laughs) Good grief. Okay. I think, well, it looks like we agree. And those are my closing remarks. So I have nothing left to add. Producer Jack? Nothing from me. Nothing further, Your Honour. <laughs> all right. Oh, well, that's it then. We have made it to the end of episode three. We are in complete agreement, all three of us, which is fantastic. Potentially a rare thing going forward. Who knows? Yeah, possibly. Possibly. Yeah. I mean, if, okay. Death to four centre backs. Let's yeah. just none of that, please. But other than that, it's all fine. Okay. It's all fine. But thank you very much, Doogie. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Jack. Thank you very much. Sorry Sam. I didn't introduce you in the first place. That's all right. I just mate. completely forgot. But you've been in front of me the I whole have time. Been here. <laughs> <laughs> and you've been excellent today on the quotes. So thank you very much Brilliant for that. Uh, thank you very much for listening. We'll see you next time. Next week, I'm on holiday. So we're going to show you or play you our pilot episode, which is a look back at one of the greatest strikers, potentially. Well, that's the Depends debate. Depends on how we that's feel about debate. it. To have played the game, we assess his legacy, we assess everything about him and we try to come to a conclusion on on just where he ranks in terms of the game's great so we're going to play you that in my absence you may notice that it's a bit rough around the edges that's what a pilot is for but you say feel- pilot i think it was still very good i think it was very good i mean i'm we're blowing steam up our own trumpets Shall we, but let's let even an expression let's let the people steam decide up our own trumpets. <laughs> i'm going to report you to football cliche <laughs> but anyway that's a long goodbye so i'll just say again thanks for listening i'll see you next time Building a business may feel like a big jump, but OnDeck Small Business Loans can help keep you afloat. With lines of credit up to $100,000 and term loans up to $250,000, OnDeck lets you choose the loan that's right for your business. As a top-rated online small business lender, OnDeck's team of loan advisors can help you find the right business loan to fit your needs. Visit OnDeck.com for more information. Depending on certain loan attributes, your business loan may be issued by OnDeck or Celtic Bank. OnDeck does not lend in North Dakota. All loans and amounts subject to lender approval. The $5 meal deal at McDonald's means you get to pick between a McDouble or a McChicken. Mm. Then get a small fry, a small drink, and a four-piece McNuggets. That's a lot of McDonald's for not a lot of money. Get the $5 meal deal today. Prices and participation may vary for a limited time only. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success, so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagina tu futuro de otra manera in capella.edu. It's time to have your high five moment with High Five Casino, the top social casino where the action and real prizes never stop. Fun spins and big wins are right at your fingertips with over a thousand games, including High Five Casino exclusives. High Five Casino is always free to play with free coins given out every four hours. Sign up today for a free welcome offer that can get you spinning and winning right away. Visit HighFiveCasino.com. High Five Casino. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. Must be 21 years or older. Terms and conditions apply.